Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. Among the wide variety of vessels used by naval forces worldwide, submarines are among the most complex and iconic due to their designs and capabilities. Operating mostly at depth, their operating processes differ from those carried out by ships on the surface. For example, the crew follows a strict protocol before submerging and starting their underwater activities. They begin with the officer of the deck standing his watch in the forward bridge structure checking for any hazards in the surroundings of the submarine. They must ensure a minimum of personnel on deck, usually restricted to a few members, such as the quartermaster of the watch and the junior officer. This is done to reduce any emergency on the surface, such as a man overboard. However, this does not eliminate the risk completely, and unfortunately, these incidents can occur. For this reason, in case it happens, the crew has tools such as the man overboard system to respond quickly to this situation. This system includes using transmitters distributed by the ship's crew that activate a warning signal once submerged in salt water for three seconds. This signal is received by a radio antenna, indicating that someone is outside the ship, detecting the sailor's position thanks to the constant transmission of the system. On the other hand, this system is also designed so that any member can activate it manually in case they see an incident or a member in danger, which increases the probability of acting faster in an emergency. These protocols, along with other processes, are learned by the entire crew during the naval preparation courses. In addition, this organization organizes several drills from time to time to keep response activities developed within the submarines. During these drills, the crew must focus on several critical points, starting with learning to activate the alarm and developing communication with the bridge to initiate rescue actions. Crew members practice various ship maneuvering techniques, such as the Williamson turn and Sharnow turn to navigate quickly to the location of the incident. After finding the person, they also learn about retrieval and first aid using life-saving equipment and specialized recovery devices. These courses also focus on other emergencies, such as fires inside these ships. Here, they focus on processes such as handling firefighting tools like extinguishers, identification of evacuation routes, and rapid distribution among the crew of personal flotation devices such as life jackets. In addition to safety protocols, the submarine crew participates in joint operations training and mission preparation. One of these cases involves launch and recovery exercises using CRRC, which are tactical inflatable boats used for rapid troop deployments. During these activities, sailors learn to prepare the boats in addition to preparing all the tools and equipment necessary to carry out their tasks. Additionally, 
During these exercises, the submarine's dry deck shelter, which is an attachable module that allows the deployment of these boats, is used. Finally, these activities include learning to maneuver the CRRC and carrying out the recovery tasks of the boat by the submarine. Although all these activities and operations are a constant part of the lives of members of the Navy, this does not mean that these people cannot dedicate time to carry out activities where they can relax and eventually boost morale. On certain ships, such as aircraft carriers, their crew occasionally participate in swim calls, which is a tradition where these sailors are offered the opportunity to take a dip in the ocean and enjoy their day. Such tradition started almost two centuries ago when the British Navy began to organize this activity among their sailors. Decades later, the U.S. Navy adopted the swim calls, which became a widespread event during and after World War II. Since then, it has been a unique experience for sailors to have a moment to share with their companions in an environment that very few have the opportunity to be in. However, despite being a relaxation activity, it is not free of dangers and incidents that could harm these people. Considering that it is an activity in the open sea, the crew members are exposed to attacks from wild animals, such as sharks. So, swim calls are usually made with safety personnel on the main boat monitoring the surroundings. Because the swimming crew may be at a considerable distance from the carrier or other vessel, one or several small boats are also deployed around the swimmers to be able to react more quickly to any eventuality that happens to these people. Usually, these types of boats are rigid hull inflatable boats that are used for support activities and can be quickly deployed from other longer vessels such as aircraft carriers. In case of any operation with these boats, Boat David systems are used to lower them into the water along with their crew. This allows these operations to be carried out quickly without requiring complex systems to prepare. All of these measures implemented during swim calls are necessary due to how unpredictable incidents such as shark attacks can be, and these can occur even in seemingly safe environments. This has happened on several occasions, such as in August 2021 when a shark approached members of the U.S. Coast Guard during a swim call. Fortunately, the measures implemented served to detect the shark in time, and the crew managed to return safely to the boat. However, this type of encounter does not always end well, and unfortunately, dramatic experiences can occur. For example, in 2018, a diver was bitten by a shark while diving near the Farallon Islands in the San Francisco area. Thanks to the quick warning from a research vessel, the Coast Guard was notified, so a helicopter was sent to pick up the victim using a rescue basket. Due to this speed, the helicopter was able to deliver the victim to Stanford University Medical Center, where he was stabilized.
The effectiveness of these operations demonstrates the importance of using vehicles such as helicopters during these incidents. Security branches such as the Coast Guard have a fleet of various helicopters, with the MH-60 Jayhawk being one of the most used during their tasks. This aircraft type has all the tools to operate in search and rescue missions, with improved avionics and sensors such as radar and infrared. In addition, it has powerful engines, such as the General Electric T-700, which allows helicopters such as the Jayhawk to lift more than 21,000 pounds and move at more than 200 miles per hour. These developments have arisen thanks to programs such as the Integrated Deep Water System Program that sought to replace Coast Guard equipment. Ultimately, many of these developments have facilitated helicopter rescues in different conditions. By having aircraft as versatile as these helicopters on hand, the Coast Guard can develop different methods and solutions to carry out its rescue operations, all following a standardized structure. Usually, these protocols begin with the reception of the help signal through radio antennas or emergency beacons either directly by the affected people or by passerby who have seen the incident. After this, the units are quickly dispatched in helicopters to the location they obtained from the distress signal or the description given by the people involved. Once the person or persons are located by the aircraft, the rescuers deploy devices to the victim to help them enter the helicopter. Usually, this includes hoisting devices such as restraining straps or rescue baskets that minimize the person's movement so as not to cause further damage. After the victim is loaded onto the helicopter, the crew uses first aid equipment included in the aircraft to help stabilize the person. At the same time, they are transported to a medical facility. This equipment can include everything from stiff neck collars and oxygen masks to defibrillators and burn gel. Depending on the person's condition, the destination may vary. For example, if they are in critical condition, they are immediately sent to a hospital. However, if their condition is stable and they have no signs of injuries, they can be taken directly to the Coast Guard facilities, or they can be sent to a safe place. Regardless of the type of emergency, each security organization, group, or branch must be prepared for these incidents that occur in the oceans. The training developed by submarine or aircraft carrier crews allows them to reduce as much as possible any danger that may occur to their members. Furthermore, the development of clear protocols and their learning facilitate the work of groups such as the Coast Guard in rescuing victims in the most austere environments and conditions. This demonstrates the importance of the development of these processes of preparation and management of emergency equipment of these different groups.
That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.